Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to discuss some of the emerging technologies that affect business and accounting, at least as of the recording date of this video. So let's talk for a minute. What are emerging technologies? Well, as you see by the definition I have here, which is sourced from Wikipedia, um, they are technologies whose development, practical applications, or both are emerging into prominence from a background of non-existence or obscurity. So in other words, technologies um, who basically either haven't existed previously or existed but just weren't widespread previously are now emerging into a more widespread prominent um, foothold. Now, why is it important to kind of know about emerging technologies? Well, first of all, because these tend to be the technologies of, technologies of the future. Some of them may return to obscurity because maybe they're not cost effective, maybe they just don't catch on for popularity for whatever reason. Some of them will go mainstream. And of course, the more knowledgeable you are about the technologies that go mainstream, the more prepped you are for your future career in business. All right, so here's a list of various emerging technologies that, again, are popular as of the recording of this video. Um, you see a list of eight items. I'm going to talk about all of these in more detail over the coming slides, but I just want to point out that no matter which of these you're thinking about in terms of an emerging technology, um, look at the note I have down here at the bottom. Programming, coding, and data science skills underlie all of the technology that you see here. So whether it's literal computer programming or coding, or, or when I say data science, what I really mean is collection of data, analysis of data, decision-making based on data. These skill sets, which are not traditionally um, what we think of when we think of, say, accounting skills, right? But they are important skills given the technological change that has been occurring in business and the accounting profession. So it's important to kind of know those skills, even if um, you don't necessarily see them as something applicable um, today. All right, so going through the list, we have eight items. First up, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the use of computers to simulate human processes such as learning, reasoning, and self-improvement. So this is basically teaching computers to think in a way and to basically mimic human thought. So. Um, what are they good for in business and accounting? Well, efficiency in processing and decision making, right? Humans take a long time to think about things, debate things, even if it's an internal decision where you're just thinking amongst yourself. Um, sometimes it just takes a while to pull a trigger, whereas artificial intelligence can simply say, given this set of criteria, here's the decision that should be made. And because it's a machine, it'll just make that choice. You see this come into play with algorithmic stock market trading, where what we call bots, make trades depending on how low or high a certain stock gets or the trend in the market or that sort of thing. You can see this in documentation processing. Um, you can see this in, in risk assessment, where basically you let a machine highlight areas of risk that you should focus on based on what we call red flags, things that are odd in the data that the machine is looking at. Next up, machine learning. Now, let me just go ahead and caveat right here that you're going to see with all of these emerging techs, um, there can be a lot of overlap basically in what they do. And so none of these necessarily stands completely on its own. For example, machine learning is essentially a form of artificial intelligence. It just has a very specific purpose. Um, machine learning allows computer systems to update their prediction models without human intervention. In other words, just as the machine sees more data and how that data is, say, classified, the machine then learns going forward how it should classify that data. Um, a very common way, not business related, but that people probably see machine learning is photo editing. Um, oftentimes when you um, take pictures, say with your smartphone, and if you go in to edit that photo, there's, a, there's an automatic edit button, right? It's some magic wand or looking thing. And, and so you click that. Well, a lot of those photo editors, that magic wand, that is based on a machine learning algorithm. It's looking at what do people prefer their photos to look like. And the more photos it sees, the more it learns, this is how I should automatically adjust based on the preferences of individuals. Um, going to business, where might you see machine learning? Things like categorizing people's expenses, Right? The more it sees that something from a place called Delta Airlines is classified as a flight, the more likely it will be to classify the expense as a flight, that sort of thing. 
flagging policy violations, right? That going back to this red flag idea, you see some anomaly in the data that shouldn't be there. Identifying trends and other anomalies. And of course, making decision recommendations, just like artificial intelligence. It's, okay, here's the data I see. Here's what I recommend based on what I know. And that recommendation could change over time in a machine learning situation based on the new data that the machine has seen since the last time it offered, say, a recommendation. All right, next up, natural language processing. We all deal with this day to day in our lives when we think about voice assistants, whether it's Siri, the, uh, the Google Assistant, whether it's um, Amazon's Alexa. Um, basically, we all deal with this idea of natural language processing. So this is a subfield of linguistics, um, computer science and AI in which computers process and analyze large amounts of language data. So the computers see the language coming in, they process the language coming in, and based on what they know about that language, they formulate replies to that language. And then, of course, through the use of machine learning, over time, they get better at understanding what's coming in and better at formulating responses. Um, basically, the challenges to this is, is recognizing speech. That's first and foremost. To get that language input, you have to be able to recognize what's coming in. And coming in could have different accents, different grammar, different actual languages being used, so forth and so on. Um, and then, of course, understanding the speech and then generating response speech. Um, what are these generally used for in business? Well, if you've ever gotten on a customer service chatbot, this is a use of natural language processing. The chatbot says, hi, I'm so-and-so pretending to be a real person. What can I help you with? You type your problem. The chatbot tries to interpret what you've written and then provide you with a chatbot response to help you out. And eventually you wind up with a real person because let's face it, these things, they're not that great today, um, but they're getting better over time. Um, data query systems, same thing. If you go type something into, and let's talk about just the most broad query system of all, let's say you go type something into a Google search, Google takes what you typed and tries to parse it. What is it that you really want to know? Let me try to provide you the response to your question. And you'll see this with Google where it's shifted over time from, say, traditional search results to now if you type, say, a question in, not only will you get the traditional search results, but you'll get questions that Google thinks you were trying to ask along with answers it thinks are applicable to those um, questions. Next up, the Internet of Things. So Internet of Things is a very common word we hear these days, um, typically abbreviated IOT. Um, this is the embedding of sensors in a multitude of devices. So this could be anything from lights, heating, air conditioning, appliances, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on. A lot of our world today has embedded microchips and sensors in them. And basically the whole point of this is connect those devices to the internet, hence the internet of real life things, tangible things. What is this good for? Well, it sits in the collection of real time data that you can use in decision making. So in other words, instead of somebody having to go out and manually collect data, the sensors in the physical objects can simply send that data to a system automatically. And so you have less errors in data entry and you have um, less subjective judgment because the machine is just grabbing what there is. Think of a thermostat instead of you saying, well, it feels hot or it feels cold. Well, the thermostat knows exactly what temperature it is and can just feed that to the system. Um, what are some uses of this in business today? Well, one big one that Amazon's playing with is smart retail shelves. Shelves that know when someone has removed a product from the shelf. Um, this is really neat because this is a situation where instead of having to go out and do manual inventory counts and then saying, oh, well, this is low, let's restock it. This is low, let's restock it, which can be a time consuming and inefficient process. Now you simply have a computer system that, oh, hey, the broccoli cheese soup is down to one can on the shelf, trigger employee number one. Hey, employee number one, can you go put more out there, right? It's a much more efficient process. Um, predictive equipment and maintenance. So you'll have sensors inside of equipment that can tell if the equipment is running too hot. If you've ever seen the screen dim on your smartphone or your tablet um, when you're in the middle of using it and just suddenly the screen dims, it's because it's got a temperature sensor in it. And when it sees it's getting too hot, it dims the screen to try to cool things down. Um, and so this can happen even with larger equipment, not just like phones and tablets, but in business, you can have machines that are looking, what's the temperature like? What is the um, production efficiency of the machine? Does there appear to be a, be a problem? And then signal someone if there does appear to be a problem. 
and streamline financial analysis and reporting. Here you can take non-financial data from the sensors, combine it with the financial data you have, and do more error-free um, financial analysis. Going back to say the store shelves, right? If the store shelves are tracking the inventory being sold, you don't have to do a physical count to see how much inventory was sold. You already have it. And so then you can do some inventory turnover analyses. Next up, blockchain. Here's one people hear about all the time, typically in its reference to cryptocurrency and especially the most popular of those, Bitcoin. What is the blockchain? It's cryptographically protected digital records. These are the blocks on the chain. And those blocks are all linked together in a single stream. That's the actual chain itself. The interesting thing about blockchain is every time a new block is created, it's an algorithmic um, calculation of the existing chain. And so what that does is that essentially protects the chain from being modified. If you want to put a new block on, it's, it's an algorithm of the blocks that came before it. If anyone tries to mess with the blocks that came before it, you're going to see an error in the algorithm calculation. And basically, it just keeps it all intact. I am not a blockchain specialist. I am, I, am, I am definitely not someone who's into all the math behind it. So forgive me if I have any small errors in my interpretation here, but here's the very just high level view of kind of how this works. So, so that it's, there's an error protection, a fraud protection, because the chain has to stay intact for the math to work. Another big benefit is it's decentralized. So what happens is basically um, there is no one system that has a copy of this chain. Anyone who wants to engage in these transactions has a complete copy of the chain on their system. And every time a new transaction is added by some system somewhere, the newly um, created chain is then synced down to all the distributed um, systems. So everyone has a copy. The copy is, is, is basically um, uh, uh, impenetrable from a fraud perspective. And, and those copies all stay in sync across multiple systems. It's actually a really neat technology. So as I mentioned, you see this in cryptocurrency. This is how things like Bitcoin and Ethereum work. Um, you can use this to have secure business transactions, basically with the distributed nature and the kind of fraud-free nature of it. If you engage in a transaction on it, that transaction is, is solid. It, you, you, you know where did something originate, where did it go. Um, there's a record of it. There's multiple copies of the record, so nobody can mess with the record. Secure accounting ledger, same thing. So whether or not it's a business transaction or it's literally your accounting system in, an, in, an, in a protected chain, um, that's where this can come in handy. And I say efficient auditing. Remember, decentralized record keeping. You could literally have your record at your company and you could have the auditor with a copy of it as well. And that way the auditor does not need to rely on you to transfer information on, to them to then audit records. They can look at it themselves. So blockchain has a lot of promise to it, um, but I, I would be remiss if I moved on without simply saying blockchain also has some problems and that is specifically um, power consumption. Because of the math um, power, because of the, sorry, the complexity of the math computations that need to be made to create the next block based on the existing chain, um, there's a lot of computing power required behind these things. And so, um, especially with something like Bitcoin, uh, it's come under fire for, hey, the power consumption for this process may not be worth the actual process. So we'll see how this plays out over time. All right, next up, unmanned aerial vehicles or UAVs, also commonly known as drones. So drones are aircrafts without human pilots. Instead, they usually have a camera or some other sensor on them. Um, how is this used today? Well, one of the primary uses, at least that you'll hear auditors talking about, is the idea of inventories. Instead of going out and physically counting a warehouse yourself with your own eyes with a team of humans, fly some drones through the warehouse. Put NS NFC tags on your um, inventory. Have an NFC reader on the drone. So between the camera and the NFC reader, the drone gets a good sense of what's in the warehouse without you having to send an army of people through the warehouse to count it. Warehouse picking. So drones, if they are big enough and if the items are small enough, can actually go and grab materials off of shelves for you. Small package deliveries. You see pharmaceutical companies and Amazon trying to get into this, where if something is lightweight enough and within a short enough distance from the distribution point, a drone could actually fly it to you and drop it off at your house rather than a physical person. And security and monitoring. Remember, 
These things have cameras, so you can actually use them as a security camera, more or less. Um, so lots of uses for drones. All right. We're on our second to last one, robotic process automation. So robotic process automation, also known as RPA, you'll notice all of these just have pretty basic initials to them. Um, this is software that can be programmed to automatically perform tasks across applications, mimicking what a human worker would, de would do. So it's basically just software that saves, saves humans from having to read and type keystrokes and file digital data. Um, and so what this is good for is when you have high volume, complex data, but it all looks very similar. So the machine can simply read it, decide what to do with it, read it, decide what to do with it, read it, decide what to do with it. So it's greater speed, accuracy, and lower cost than a human having to read it, file it, figure out what to do with the next one, read it, file it, and go so on and so on. So big, uh, big uses here. Application processing. This could be credit applications, this could be human resource applications, whatever it is, applications have a standardized format to them, right? And so your robotic process automation can simply read the application, see if it contains the things it needs, and then send it to the next place appropriately, depending on is it ready to be processed? Does it have a problem and you have to return it to sender? If it's, a say, an application for a job, does it meet the criteria? Pass it on to human resources. Does it not meet the criteria? Reject it. Right? This is what your software can do. Um, accounting period closings, that's another area, pretty standardized thing where you close your revenue accounts, close your expense accounts, true up your retained earnings. Right, You can just create software to do that for you. Tax returns, again, forms that have a standardized format, standardized data, the software can read it, the software can process it. You don't need a human being to siphon through this stuff anymore. All right, last one, continuous monitoring slash auditing. So two things very similar, but slightly different purpose. Continuous monitoring is an internal process that examines accounting process practices, risk and controls, compliance, IT, and business procedures on an ongoing basis. So basically a continuous monitoring of your accounting systems and your operations and your IT systems all at the same time for management to just keep an eye on. What's good about this? Real-time error checking and data verification. It's not a matter of wait till you go prepare the financial statements and then you might find an error. Real-time monitoring allows those errors to get flagged early on. Um, Real-time insight into business threats, right? It's not a matter of saying, oh, look, this quarter our sales were down. I wonder why. And then next quarter they're down even more. I wonder why. And then trying to find out what's going on and realizing, hey, there's a new competitor or hey, you've been sabotaged in your reviews on Amazon, or whatever the case may be. Instead, now you have real-time monitoring. When those sales start to trend down relative to, say, prior periods or relative to expectations, the computer can flag you earlier on and say, hey, just, just bring it to your attention. You have a negative trend happening here that was unexpected. You might want to look into it now, not wait till the end of the quarter or even the end of two quarters um, to start figuring out what's going on. Continuous auditing is similar because this is the same thing as continuous monitoring, except it's gonna provide this information um, to the auditors. So real-time access to information system processes, transactions, and controls. Um, what does this allow you to do? Well, just like it allows the business to notice bad trends before they become a bigger problem, it allows the auditors to find problems before they become bigger problems. So more timely audit findings. Less reliance on sampling. When auditors have a, a, a systematic link to your company records, they don't have to say, hey, give me X number of samples to audit. They can just have their computers audit everything that's flowing through the system, right? 100% auditing. So um, less reliance on sampling and the error that comes along with that. And then um, both of those things combined, I should have put these in a different order, both of those things combined just lead to more efficient and less costly audits. Right? If problems don't blow out out of hand, if auditors don't have to waste time with the data collection because it's happening automatically, you get a more efficient and therefore less costly audit. All right, that's it. There's a lot of them going on, but it, this is a high technology world that we are starting to enter. Um, and so you're gonna see these technologies um, become more widespread in, in accounting and in business in general as time goes on. I'm sure give it five to 10 years, I'm gonna have to record a new video with new technologies in it because some of these are gonna just be the commonplace at that point, right? Um, so with that said, I hope you found this helpful.
and I hope you join me for another video.